Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we've taken a closer look at the temptations that people have to see if we can figure out why we're tempted to commit sins. People generally commit sins because they're after something they want, and they sin in an attempt to get it. So we've been looking over the things people want. However, today I thought we'd bring it all together and see what conclusions we can draw from these various truths about temptation. We looked at the different kinds of power and why people are drawn to it, as well as how power can be handled properly, and why many people pursued flawed, compromising power instead. We questioned why people want fame, crave acceptance, seek pleasure, and pine after security, which is very rarely definite. We looked at how we can be compromised by laziness, by fixating on our firmly held longings, desire to accomplish, or for excitement, beauty, satisfaction, or riches. We also examined how even the quest for knowledge, a noble pursuit in most cases, can lead people to make mistakes, and there are several points that all of these temptations have in common. To start with, none of these things are, in and of themselves, evil. However, when people become obsessed with acquiring them, there are many dangers associated with that. In general, the biggest danger is of being led, tricked, or coerced into sin while in pursuit of one of these things. Therefore, we shouldn't be in an obsessive rush to acquire any of these things because none of them is as important as eternal life in heaven, which has more value than all of them combined. This is because the good things available to the saints in heaven put the goods of this life to shame. I can draw this conclusion based on the position that God has more good things to offer than anyone else does, since he's the very source and true nature of all goodness. This is a position I've held for many years, and I think that anyone who agrees with me on this will probably come to the same or a similar conclusion, that God can offer them more than the world can. However, every major claim should be backed up with some kind of evidence, so this seems like a good time to look at a few reasons why we should think of God as the source of all goodness. First, one of the most basic truths about God is that he's perfect. An imperfect being wouldn't be God. To be perfect means needing nothing further. Therefore, God must have all good things, or else there would be something else that he'd need. If he didn't have everything good, therefore, he'd be imperfect, and therefore not God. Because the Gospel of John says that all things were made by him, therefore, we can conclude that God is the source of limitless good things. Secondly, the moral argument for God's existence is, premise one, if God doesn't exist, objective moral values don't exist. Premise two, objective moral values do exist, therefore, conclusion, God exists. Basically, how can there be any kind of firm moral law unless there is a moral law giver? This argument establishes a morally perfect God, and to be morally perfect, involves being as moral as it's possible to be. It's possible for a being to be so moral that their choices are the very foundation and measuring stick of all other moral choices. So God is the source of all moral goodness in this way. Third, it's a long-proven truism that you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have a loaf of bread, you can't give me a loaf of bread. However, God gave everything in the universe to its inhabitants. He produced these good things like stars, planets, elements, and fundamental forces, and therefore had them to give, and would still have had them to give, even if he'd never created the universe. However, if you give me a loaf of bread, I have one more loaf than I had before, and you have one less. God doesn't work that way, because God is infinite. And when something is infinite, no matter how much you take away from it, more always remains. Therefore, God will always have more of the good things that he put into the universe, and is the source of those good things. There are other reasons to believe that God is the source of all goodness, but I think these are the strongest ones. I consider this very important, because the shallow, sterile conceptions that many people have of heaven, and which have been spread far and wide in Christian literature, don't seem to have much basis on these grounds. The typical description of heaven offered by saints or ancient visionaries tends to be limited to the basic facts, that God is there, the angels, the saints, music. In short, less than half of what the Bible says is in heaven. Needless to say, a lot is left out of such descriptions, with almost no interest paid even to things like heavenly food, drink, and enjoyment, much of which, as I said, can be gleaned by just reading the Bible in any case. When on top of all that, our culture has so far called into question how good heaven can possibly be, in the rare cases where the topic is addressed at all, you can see what the problem is. 
The world can't offer people anything that lasts forever, and people generally recognize that. So one of the methods the devil has of tricking people into becoming distracted by worldly affairs and desires and forgetting heaven is to try to convince them that the good things of earth won't be attainable in heaven also, that heaven won't have possessions, pleasures, unique experiences, or in general, the sorts of things that would be acceptable to pay a person with. If this statement were true, I would consider it a fair point. After all, if you're about to spend all eternity with no money, pleasure, or unique experiences, no matter where you end up, a good case could be made for enjoying them while you have them. But while the culture of our world may say that in heaven there is no beer, or that only the good die young, they don't have any evidence of it. And while some, like C.S. Lewis, claim that heaven doesn't offer the desires of mercenary souls, I've never heard them give a really good explanation of what exactly is meant by the parable of the pearl of great price in that case, or how God can lack things in heaven that he created so plentifully on earth or how Jesus can speak of eternal life in reference to an existence that is nothing like living at all. Taking all of these factors into consideration, I'm fully convinced that there's plenty of reason to believe that God is the ultimate source of everything that's good and enjoyable, and therefore that all of those things will be plentiful in heaven, which, as I see it, goes a long way towards disarming the power of every last form of temptation in existence. Suddenly, sinning becomes like enjoying one bite of chocolate now, but sacrificing a hundred thousand that you could have had later. The economics of a choice like that are considerably worse if we accept that God is the source of all goodness. Next time, we'll open up our third season on the meaning of the Psalms, beginning with Psalm 51. See you then. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.